Good day chaps. So today's video is going to begin to look over the future tank studies program and some of the tanks designed by the various UK firms. And while largely forgotten about today, they mark an important chapter in the British tank studies. The first in this series will look at the Leopard 2 Alvis hybrid tank, what it was and who designed it, why and what happened to these designs. The future tank studies began back in 1982 under the head of Defence Procurement Vice Count Trenchard and in the traditional British project management methods managed to proverbially tie its own Velcro shoes together and then promptly trip over itself in several places, although its origins are far simpler and cleanly laid out. There are a large number of vehicles, ideas, concepts and theories put forwards in this period and the programme came under several different names including the post-1995 tank and MBT-95. The MOD sent out formal invitations in or around March 1982, although some groundwork can be traced back prior to this. This letter was then circulated to the heads of the British industry at that time and focuses on them designing and developing tanks for the use by the MOD. These companies were listed as GKN, Alvis Limited, then under United Scientific Holdings, Vickers and Royal Ordnance. And at the same time, the traditional defence bodies such as MV and RADI were also involved, leading to an entirely separate but related set of projects, such as the Challenger PIP and three-man challenges with autoloaders, etc. But for now, we'll just focus on the industry projects. These four firms already had an established foothold in the defence sector and in some cases had been making tanks for as long as they've existed. But up until this point would generally receive a set of specifications from the general staff and attempt to build a vehicle to those guidelines. In this programme the tables were turned and the Ministry of Defence wanted new eyes and instead set the firms to designing vehicles to a rather loose set of guidelines and wanted their creative input rather than old preconceived ideas. This came about at the same time as the UK was still beginning to receive Challenger 1 and MBT-80 was in its final death throes. This led the Minister to record that the order for Challenger by 1987 would leave about 25% of the fleet with Challengers at the time and the rest still with Chieftain, which by that period was becoming hopelessly obsolete. Yet in a moment of clarity they also felt that by the mid-90s, the army would face a proliferation of anti-tank weapons, including specialised top and bottom attack munitions, and that tanks like the Challenger could become obsolete in a traditional role, and that a more agile and survivable tank would be required. To achieve this objective, within an affordable unit cost, would require these innovative ideas, both in the area of components, systems and concept designs. Thus, the new vehicle must be smaller, faster, and have a reduced crew, yet more lethality. It's also worth noting very quickly here that the Minister very clearly pointed out that this programme, as part of the industries, would not guarantee any further development or guarantees of production, and at this stage they wanted to see proposals and models only, but that promising designs or concepts could possibly progress further depending on needs and requirements. However, any design would need to be theoretically ready for production by early 1995. Other criteria were set down, but these fill more generic aspects of tank design. For example, it must fit NATO rail gauge measurements, be able to resist all current threats and counter any enemy tank, be adaptable for future growth and so on. All fairly generic requirements although a very strong emphasis was placed on the notion of export sales. So with the basics out of the way, let's have a look at the first of these three vehicles, the Alvis Hybrid, a joint venture between Alvis and Krauss Meffei of Germany. Alvis then set about this project with some gusto, presenting a very large set of folders for consideration. They looked over the requirements and found five key points, notably that any vehicle would be able to achieve the objective within an affordable unit cost, the possibility that the army could no longer afford to develop a new tank nationally, 
a desire for overseas collaboration, the potential for export sale of the future tank, and that the predicted operating area of this tank was Northwest Europe, and that a vehicle would be focused on operating within this region. Unlike the others who had chosen to more or less remain on a national design basis, Alvis chose to partner up with Krauss Maffei. They felt they already had a good working partnership with this company, and that the Leopard 1 and Leopard 2 hulls were already proven and had a good track record of sales in the area listed, Northern Europe. Alvis are also very aware that joint projects between the UK and Germany had in the past fallen flat on their faces, particularly down to domestic industrial disputes, and both sides wanting ideally what was best for their own nation's interests. However, by more or less splitting the vehicle in two, with the Germans focusing on the hull and some turret parts, and Alvis focusing on the system, software and fittings, it would ideally be easier to manage, and they felt that their recent collaboration with the Belgians and CVRT was an indicator that they could make such a project work. Alvis also felt that, in line with the MOD's requirement for a lighter vehicle, relying on innovative ideas and new components, but a reduction in weight, would require a redesign as just lowering the weight by reducing the armour would not be effective. And so they chose to replace the conventional turret with an externally mounted gun. And while this might surprise folks, the UK has a long history of looking at externally mounted gun tanks, going back to 1952, and about a third of all of our studies and programmes have somewhere along the line involved them. This combination would both lower the weight and increase survivability by profile reduction, as well as crew reduction, and be more affordable compared to a conventional main battle tank. The hybrid tank would therefore have a high velocity main gun mounted externally with an integral automatic reloading system accessing both ready rounds and hull stowed rounds. It would have an all hull crew module with enhanced protection and unified services that allowed any member of the crew to operate any of the main responsibilities if needed. It would also have a proven high efficiency powertrain and suspension system, already in service, thus lowering costs, and have better protection for the crew in a hold down position and a much lower profile of just one square meter above a raised position. And finally, a fully integrated set of communications, optics and threat detection systems. Alvis aimed to get the three priorities as crew survivability first, then firepower, with automotive aspects in third. And they also set out a future path of what was needed, risk factors and costs. They felt that the hull, engine and transmission were low risk, as proven, while medium risk areas were the autoloader and the human operating systems, and that the overall project would need a working demonstrator to a cost of £3.2 million, and any working prototype they felt would be ready for about February 1995, which was the deadline for the overall MBT-95 project. As to the weapons, they initially looked at whether to go for a gun vehicle or a missile vehicle, and chose the gun based on the following principles. That missiles take up twice the space of conventional rounds in stowage, and as I've bleated on endlessly in other videos, internal volume is a defining factor in any tank design. Yet you need four times the number of rounds to be as efficient in a tank kill ratio as the missiles, albeit this being by 1980 standards. Therefore the volume efficiency was 50% less for tank rounds. However missiles were also more expensive, and this could affect overseas sales and require more training and support. And also, at the time before fire and forget missile technology was available, the guaranteed long-range hits while the tank was not in some way exposed to return fire, and the active defence systems were becoming more commonplace, which had already begun to show effective counters to anti-tank guided missiles. The missiles of choice at the time were either the more conventional heat types or the experimental chem or kinetic energy missiles, something that both the UK and the USA were heavily involved in trying to develop. Yet these hefty old lads at the time took up a lot of space and were far too high risk. Missiles also had two further drawbacks, which involved the close-in fire support being inefficient at below 500 metres at the time, 
with them taking up to about two and a half seconds to acquire and guide the missile, which in urban fighting is not desirable, and provided expensive overkill against softer targets such as light vehicles, where the cost of just one missile was often worth more than the target. The choice of a gun-missile hybrid had also been brought up, and these have been studied a lot and built by the US and in particular the Soviets. Yet for all that they add more complexity, maintenance time and reduced volume. And when one considers the sheer amount of money spent by, say, the Russians in building and fitting these missiles to tanks, they've not yet to date proven any recognisable difference in battle, with almost no data to show that they've ever even been used effectively against armour. Next up was the question of how to deal with helicopters. In the 1980s, these were considered the biggest threat to tanks in battle, over that of even enemy tanks, and so forth. Tests carried out in 1980 in the US showed that the crews had a hard job of optically spotting a helicopter at 3-4 to four kilometers distance, and by the time they did, any helicopter would also have its own missiles in flight, or worse. To counter them, the only way they felt was then to mount radar and a weapon of around 25-30mm. to 30 millimeters. But again, this added weight, took up a lot of space for ammunition, and further added cost and complexity and so no dedicated anti-helicopter weapon was added. However, they state that the Germans were working on an anti-helicopter main gun round and, due to its modular nature, a dedicated support system could always be added on at a later date. So how did this gun system work? Well, Alvis looked at several proposals and ideas, and as we've seen, the UK has a long history of experimenting on external guns, with vehicles like Comres, Vulcan and others, and at the same time, studies such as STT Excalibur 120 were also being carried out, while the Swedish also built working concepts with a lot of mutual correspondence. These can be broken down to several types. For example, there's the cat and mouse style with a link arm and the ammunition fed from a rear hull. A bar link system with the ammunition fed from the main body, although this can lead to risks. And a swing arm transfer system to mention but a few. Other projects, such as the STT Cassandra project and one of the MBT-95s, used a chaser system in which the ammunition was fed from a rear breech by a link arm method into an external gun. However, the system chosen was a hybrid of a krauss maffei idea and UK studies, which involved two different systems in one. The first part was a revolver-type ready rack of rounds surrounding the main gun which fed back quickly into a breech with 10 rounds available and once depleted the rounds could be reloaded from a rear armoured bin via a link arm mechanism or fed directly into the breech itself. Although ideally suited to a single piece round from the German smoothbore gun, Alvis did state that such a system could use a two piece ammunition of the British rifle gun with some modification. The estimated rate of fire was around 10 rounds per minute and then the weapon could either reload the revolver magazine or directly lift the rounds out of the rear bin and into the breech and fire a single shot. A 20 round rear stowage bin could also be modified by fitting an extra road wheel if needed. And in the case of a duff round, it could be extracted by the autoloader and fed back down into the rear ammo rack. And both the revolver rack and the rear bin had built in blow off panels in the event of an ammunition fire. The narrow shape of the turret and the armoured fore section offered good protection for the rounds, at least from the front, and in the event of an ammunition being ruptured, the crew were far safer in the hull, while the rear ammunition bins were separated from the crew by an armoured bulkhead. Another advantage of such a system was the easy removal of the turret and the fitting of different modules, for example a conversion to a driver training vehicle or bridge layers where conventional turrets can be a hindrance in design phase. This idea allowed for far more variations of the basic hull system to be considered. The team also looked over the optical systems, which are always a problem on external gun tanks. And, truth be told, very few devices will ever beat the good old-fashioned Mark I eyeball. Yet when your crew are all stuffed in the hull, this becomes very hard in a hull down position. Using conventional periscope systems leads to lots of working parts in such a system, as well as light dispersion over long distance. Fibre optics were considered, but still not a proven system for this sort of application. 
And so they choose to use a low light television system with solid state circuits, which could easily relay the images between the various crew. And Alvis already had spent some time testing this concept on a series of light tanks, although at least one backup optical system would remain for emergencies. So moving on to the hull. The main hull to be used was that of the Leopard 2. And this made sense to Alvis as they already had a viable export option, much more so than British tanks, certainly. And it had proven adaptable as well. An early change was to remove two of the road wheels from 7 to 5 and to shorten the hull a fair bit as less internal space was needed. And by lowering the internal ammunition count in the rear bins down to 20 rounds, this kept the tank under 50 tonnes, which was a listed requirement. The suspension type could either be of torsion or hydrogas, and while torsions do take up under armour volume, it was also considered cheaper and more viable for overseas sales. While hydrogas is better all round for not taking up internal space, thus the design was made to fit either or types to suit the customer's needs. For survivability, the Alvis team set to design a box within a box layout, with all the crew in the hull, and this was to be a three-man tank as no loader was needed. Well, but in my opinion, that would have stalled it with any British use, as we are very much sure that loaders are an integral part of the crew. They also make the tea, easily the most vital part of any of the process. In fact, the poor loaders have arguably the hardest job. Not only physically, but they also have to learn the role of becoming a tank commander, looking after the newbies, while at the same time every company out there is trying to Thanos click them out of existence. Alves went on to state that up-armouring a tank from the conventional gun tank of the time and saving a lot of weight was not really possible, without massive compromises. The thickest arm of this vehicle was therefore 200mm, while the rest was around 30 to 40 millimeters. And instead of bulk armour, they chose to go with three other aspects, that of profile and shape, agility and manoeuvrability, and active defence systems. Armour, as stated, was provided by conventional steel with a backing spool and radiological plates, and used the power pack system for added armour. Now this remains somewhat a controversial topic today, as while it does offer increased crew protection, it also comes with the downside that any penetrating round has effectively also knocked out one's engine, and an immobile tank will quickly become a dead tank. Agility was the next aspect. While top speed is not that important in tank warfare, after all, tanks are not top trump cards. Being able to do 70 km an hour is all very well, but often very much rarely used in any practical sense, while the ability to quickly accelerate and manoeuvre is more important to gain a quick burst of speed. Thus, the engine would be usable in a dual format, with a half-on, half-off system, which could be overcharged for a quick burst of movement, but for routine operations be idling over on about half power. Several engines were looked at, both gas turbines and regular diesel packs, and either could be used if needed. But as standard, they chose the MTU-881 engine, which should be used up with a 1200 horsepower, coupled to an LSG-3000 transmission. And the final weight of the vehicle with all this came to 44 tonnes. Ultimately, as with all of these vehicles in this project, none of them ended up being built. Work began on Challenger 2 a few years after MBT-95 began and would go on to become the vehicle used by the British Army and was far more conventional compared to the future tank projects. But they do show an interesting and today forgotten aspect in the British tank story. In the next part, I'll begin to go over the other projects from the industries as well as Rady and MV. And if you did like this video or you want to see more of these tanks, give it a share or a like as this helps the channel grow. But until next time, Toodle pip.